one of these gentlemen that just produced a lot, conjured a lot of flow and desire inside of me, he asked me, he's like, what's your end game? And I just was like, first of all, that was like the hottest thing that I think a guy could ever ask me. Cause I'm like, <laughs> an ambitious woman. And I'm like, you just asked me what my end game is. Yes. <laughs> and it like, it just was, a, I flowed in the moment. And I said, I want to create the equal and opposite to Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. Bruce Lee, you cannot argue that Bruce Lee was like this, the ultimate specimen of like male physiology. And I want to know what is the, like when Bruce Lee says one inch punch, what is that for the female and female physiology? Because I can tell you it's not a one inch punch. I can tell you <laughs> it is, but it's not a one inch punch. And so to me, Muse Cycles is me acting on that promise to myself where I was like, I'm going to figure out what the Jeet Kune Do is. Like, how do I train my body and my physiology and my mind in order to like be at my optimum? Sutra podcast where we discuss all things flow and all things self-transcendence. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you and welcome. Today I have a very, very special guest on the show. We have Shara Rocks, designer, inventor, dancer, creator of Muse Cycles. She is an amazing woman studying the effects of fertility on creativity and innovation. And we are going to be talking about all things flow, fertility, creativity, and all of the amazing juiciness of being a woman in the 21st century. So let's dive right in. If, you know, more women step into the aspect of their feminine biology, then that in itself will bring about a balance in how we function as a culture and society. And I think it's really important work that you're doing, Shara. So, like, it's amazing, fascinating. I love how you're blending all the fertility awareness with creativity and neuroscience and, you know, absolutely love to geek out on this stuff um and i i absolutely love having you here and having you know people listen to all of this stuff especially women a lot of you know my listeners are women so i i want to be able to bring them that level of depth and knowledge and passion that you have for the subject i mean it doesn't matter if you know the future is faster than we think and you know <laughs> your level of dedication and your level of uh, you know novelty and creativity that you bring to your inventions and and the the depth and the research that goes into it that ultimately matters and and it's so apparent that there's so much that you bring in terms of this really really important topic that half of the population of the world needs to know about um, <laughs> half half so there's a there, there's half half and I truly believe but to take the stage and use my words with the same kind of captivation that I would a choreography and to use my words to bring a discovery on the cutting edge of neuroscience and to bring it to 50 percent of the human population in which if they knew that one word or that one insight or that one way of explaining something that is inside of us that we always intuitively felt but haven't quite had the tools to pay attention to, that being on stage or, or presenting on a forum or in an online summit to be able to share, disseminate like this finding, if that were to spark the, the, a new language around our cycles, I would imagine within like a generation, we could literally change our relationship to our bodies, to our hormones, to our periods, to ovulation, to our fertility. And the biggest thing is I would love to see in, in this future is that just like we don't believe that sex is just for procreation anymore, why do we believe that fertility is just for making babies? Mm -hmm. I 
have been using and tracking my fertility for my creative process, to build my own magnum opus, to fund my own, to bet on myself. I don't have VC, but I, you know, I bet on myself and my ability to produce and to, and, and to be a creatrix. And I've only been able to do that because I have doubled down on fertility awareness. And so this is a message. I hope that I could use a platform and stage to bring fertility awareness to, to more people outside of the context of family planning and reproduction. Yeah, and, and it's fascinating, right? Like when, when I first stumbled upon the fertility awareness method, it was like going and seeing like a fertility doctor and she actually sat down with me and told me about all these things that I had no idea about. I was like, right. what? I'm supposed to measure my cervical position. <laughs> like, I, right. right. <laughs> I was like, what? Right. What is basal body temperature? And what is, you know, like, obviously we had some idea of cervical fluid, but like, if you haven't been observing it, you have no idea that, you know, it's correlated to the different phases of the cycle, right? Right, right. And it's, and you know, but there was a level of empowerment that came with actually understanding, um, this my cycle and and you know i thought back and i was just like why isn't this taught you know why are exactly in, why exactly like why isn't this taught like for me it was so when i was dancing full-time and professionally i had an entire team of body workers that were like literally they were their job was to make sure my body could perform at peak when i was dancing full-time and professionally and one of my uh, body care team members, she had this book in her studio called Taking Charge of Your Fertility. And I was like, ooh, what is that about? And I took this book, I read it in one afternoon, and literally, as soon as I shut it, I said, never again will I not know that this was what my body has been telling me for 30 years. Why didn't anyone tell me this sooner? And I'm getting an app for that. And so I literally... <laughs> got my first that's when i downloaded my very first cycle tracking app it was um you know it was in 2012 and literally from like i just i just couldn't believe that like i i've always felt connected to my body as a dancer and i still couldn't believe that there was just so much going on in my cycle to tell me about what was going on in my body that i was just like i could have been tracking this ever since i was at the ballet bar as a girl training, you know, in my body. I was like, why, why didn't anyone tell me this sooner? Yeah, did you feel angry? Because I felt angry. I felt angry that this wasn't common knowledge, that this wasn't taught to us as, you know, as girls when, when we should have had that kind of, you know, knowledge passed down to us. And it's not just right. something taboo that's passed down to us, you know? Right, right. It, it more like, I took it on as a personal vendetta to right that wrong. <laughs> it became my personal mission to use subversive tactics to make fertility awareness like so craveable that a, that like a woman who thinks that fertility awareness and data tracking and cervical mucus and all that is just like, cause I literally had friends like, when I first discovered my muse, which is like my synonym for ovulation, like when I discovered my muse, when I discovered how ovulation makes me feel, how ovulation makes me think, how ovulation just, just lights me up. I was like, oh my God, I literally went to the baddest ass women I knew. And I said, oh, here's my data. This is what happened to me. Oh my God, this is what happens to us. I was like, this is so amazing. And I'll never forget, like, I'm a homegirl. She looks at me and she says, Shara, I'm a modern woman. Woman, I don't have time for that. And I was, it hit me so, like, so deep that I was just like, okay. I, I did I kind of, you know, I was like, okay. I didn't, I didn't say much, but I, I decided that moment. I was like, I'm going to design a way that gets women so turned on about their bodies and their cycles that they will never not, not want to track. I, I, I was just like, I will figure it out. Like I used to work in big brand advertising. So I will take all of that, like a career experience from like making 
like brands like, you know, just for consumer products, craveable. And I will design in an experience that is so amusing, so delightful, that is so sexy that women will be like, oh my God, can I please uh, buy a Wanfo strip test and start taking my luteinizing hormone starch kits? Because, <laughs> oh my God, like, oh, I've discovered my muse, hallelujah. Like, and, and so that, that's essentially what I have been doing is as a, as a, when I say I'm an inventor, I'm an inventor because, um, you know, when we talk about cycles, we're talking about prediction, right? We're talking about predictive power. When we're talking about fertility awareness, for me, it was, I needed the predictive power in order to have more choice over how I bring life into this world. And so I needed that power, that predictive power to be as accurate and precise as some of the best kind of tech that's available to like financial modeling or, you know, getting a guy on the moon. And so I realized I was like, if this phone in my pocket and the apps aren't quite right, I feel like, I was like, I feel like there's more going on in my cycle than just the fertile window. I was like, I really want to understand like all of the nuance that I feel. And that's when I had to start to create my own algorithms to, to sense like these, these patterns that I call new cycles. Cause there were nine different kind of states of being in my mind and in my body and in my cycle that I would feel shift change as I was moving into and out of my fertile window. And it was, it, it, it's, it's almost like to think about it, like the cycle, we, we have a lens of the cycle that we're taught, which is about the, 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 the period. So we see our, our bodies and ourselves through that lens. And that lens is, oh, you know, I have my period or I don't have my period. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe I want to become a mom one day. And it's like, then you see, start to see your cycle through the lens of the ovaries. And you're like, oh, well, there's a fertile window and there's a time when I can conceive or not conceive. And in any time you're bringing more attention or awareness to a pattern, you start to feel, see more and more and more of it. And that is when literally it's like, oh, it's, there's more going on than just my period. Then it was like, oh, now that I like kind of, you know, move through like this peak of fertility, there's more going on. And I was able to kind of go in deeper and another layer and another layer. And that's when I realized that my cognition, the way I think, the way I feel, literally the, 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 the way that I produce creative thoughts, that was changing in sync with my cycle. And why it became an invention is because my cognitive state started to become predictive for my ovarian cycle phase. And literally my cognitive state of saying, oh, I'm really feeling like I'm in fifth muse started to be predictive of, oh, I just tested positive for luteinizing hormone surge. I'll be ovulating soon. And that was just one out of nine patterns that kept lining up. So what I find absolutely fascinating about what you do and why it's so different is because my experience with fertility tracking and awareness, it's been very much in the realms of, okay, what kind of activities do I do around this time? Because my body's telling me to say, slow down during my period and go within introspect, uh, you know, and during the ovulation period, it's the opposite. It's like, go up, explore you know, do creative things. And, but that creative, that creativity sort of waxes and wanes around that window of fertility is what I've noticed. And, and your work especially stands out to me because you're linking fertility with neuroscience and cognitive thinking patterns. And how do you then, you know, in your research, how do you link the different phases of the ovarian cycle, menstrual, follicular, you know, luteal, a menstrual fit. How do you link those bases to neuroscience? I'm fascinated. Okay. Well, this is kind of a magical moment. It's kind of a, a period of my life that kind of led to where we are today. So <laughs> one of my favorite things to do in the world is um, just go into a library or in this case, it was Powell's books. So imagine in the United States, 
a bookstore that has almost any book you can imagine that is several city blocks large. And this is really big for the US because Amazon kind of took over the bookstore. And so um, I walk in one day just out of like, I just was like, probably procrastinate. I probably had something to do for entrepreneurship or business. I probably was like, I'm just going to go to Pal's Books. <laughs> and so I go to Pal's Books. And I don't have any agenda. I just am like open to novelty, most likely close to um, like uh, increasing uh, estrogen because often I find I'm very open to new experiences or getting a, like a wanderlust to go explore my environment around this time. And so I'm naturally just following that inclination and I walk into Pal's books and I, this book jumps off the shelf. I actually have it right here. Dr. Shelley Carson's Your Creative Brain. Harvard Research. I read this book. I still have the receipt, but I'll never forget. It was October 2015. It was at this point I had been tracking for about 50 cycles. And you can see all of, like literally, you can see how I just was tearing this book up. I just was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Because when I was reading this book, I was reading Dr. Shelley Carson's literal, literal, like I'll show you right here. So it may, well, actually we have to, I'll, I'll explain it for your reader, for the listeners. But Dr. Shelley Carson took uh, aspects of the creative process and put that under fMRI and then literally captured what the brain is doing at different phases of the creative process. And then each chapter was about you know, how to access that brain set in order to uh, maximize imagination, productivity, and innovation. I was like, okay, so I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, the absorbed brain set. That, and then I was looking at my cycle diary. I was like, that is exactly what I was writing in my own cycle. Oh my God, the reason brain set. I was writing about that in my cycle diary. Oh my God, another brain set and another brain set. And pretty much every chapter that she described, I was already writing in my cycle journal because I captured three data points. I captured my ovarian biomarkers. I captured my creative thinking and I captured my uh, sexual desire. Cause yeah, it's important. And <laughs> it's actually a lot of, a lot of neuro, there's a lot of good neurology going on to, to cap. That's a very good data set to capture. I love and how so, you say when you have sex on the brain, the woman's just getting ready to burp her creative <laughs> ideas. I love that. <laughs> right, right, right. So, but it's really cool because what I was seeing is there was this relationship between peak fertility, sexual receptivity, and the brain's receptivity for insight and idea. Literally, as the body is receptive, the brain is receptive. Literally, as I, the reason why we are here today is because Dr. Shelley Carson showed me the neuroscience of what a creative brain is doing. And because I was already tracking in my own body's data, once she showed me what was going on in between my two ears, the pattern just revealed itself for me. And that is when I was able to, um, yeah, I don't know if you can see all my stickies, all my sticky notes back there, all my all my posters. But I literally just mapped out the ovarian cycle and Dr. Shelley Carson's brain states. And I just started looking at that day after day after day. And I started honing my awareness and sharpening like my inner x-ray vision. And all of a sudden, like I was like, yeah, this is the creative brain state that Dr. Shelley Carson was saying. And I Put it together in my model and in my invention that this is when it's connected to this part of the ovarian cycle and how interesting when i take a hormone test it confirms that i'm in that phase so the very things i was feeling and observing in my own body were as powerful as some of these your engineers powerful some of the the latest and hottest femtech literally like femtech engineering out on the market and I just was doing it like with pen at first, just with pen and paper, just hand calculating it all. Yeah. And that's how I discovered my muse. 
<laughs> yeah, I did the same. Maybe not, definitely not as in depth as you, but just basic fertility awareness method, plotting all the graphs. And I was doing that for a while until, um, until I started using uh, Daisy. Oh yeah. And, but Daisy again, good for, you know, your, where in your cycle you are in basal body temperature. It doesn't tell me, you know, the level of creativity that I could experience in this part of my cycle or how my hormones are fluctuating. You know, it doesn't have to tell me all of that. So Shara, you're the inventor of uh, Muse Cycles and I love how it's linking the cognitive, creative, fertility aspects and how that can be so important for women because um, if women were to sync their cycles according to these patterns, then they're able to get way more out of their lives, right? There's so much more right. meaning instead of forcing um, ourselves to go into like a male dominated field where you're always go, go, go without any rest, but the female cycle doesn't allow for that. So then how would you, how would you maximize those creative insights during the ovulatory period? So, so say you know that your ovulation takes place roughly you know that week at least you know that week yes. what are some of the steps that you personally take to maximize you know what you yes. can get out of that period so um i'm very very fierce about eradicating the western myth of productivity and success from my like from my sense of self-worth Mm -hmm. I literally have eradicated as much as I can <laughs> the Western myth of success from my own personal self-worth. And so what that does is it frees me if I know that my female body in its peak as estrogen is rising is informing my brain and that function is highly receptive. Well, then I, I get to kind of fall into receptivity instead of high performance like go 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 it's like i might open up my schedule because i know i'm actually more receptive and the more space i give and the more time i allow the more actually the slower more sensuous that i go the more that i make space for that flash of insight it literally is like um there's a Western myth of like for Edison, it was 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And I'm like, huh, the muse says it's 99% inspiration, 1% perspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that is, so the first thing is like really like taking, like I actually had to go to India to find new myths of like what it is to be powerful and feminine, like the goddesses of Lita Trimpura Sundari or Durga or, like I just, I just immersed myself in like the Indian mythos of the feminine in order to find new models of like being in, in this feminine and female body of mine mm -hmm. that felt much closer to, that helped, that made me feel closer to nature, that made me feel closer to, to the things about femininity that are just so enriching and just so enjoyable. And, um, and so the, another very practical thing I did is I really, since day one, have been keeping a journal and I moved that tracking, um, a journal into actually like a Leonardo da Vinci style note taking. So I created a Muse Cycles notebook where I capture and like, I do not let a thought go by that is when I'm in a, when I'm in one of these ovulatory neurophysiological states, I do, I capture what I'm thinking in that moment with, and, and I just, I don't judge it. I just let it flow. I just get it out. And if I need to get it out through voice recording, if I need to get it out, you know, with my two thumbs, I make sure that I get that idea out. And so what's really cool is since I started and developed this new cycles notebook, um, I have captured about 7,555 musings about specifically about work since um, 20, the beginning of January 2019. And in my musings, and literally I'm able to kind of go through like a database and like pull out, there is an invention in there. There is keynote presentations in there. There is like a, like a whole brand campaign strategy in there. 
and all I'm, I'm not, I'm not really like working. I'm just musing. And yet it helps me because like, even for example, for this interview, this interview, like I really wanted to take like kind of seize like carpe mensis, like seize the opportunity where I was in my cycle. And because we're in two different parts of the world, um, I, I, I felt like I could go in very well prepped for this um, on a short notice because all I had to do was query my own new cycles notebook and like kind of see these thoughts that I had about the questions that you were gonna ask me. And it, it, it's just, it, 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 feed, it feeds back high performance on itself if that makes any sense, right? Instead of me trying to exert high performance, it's like, how could I be so effortless that the high performance just happens? Mm -hmm. mm, I love that. So, so you would then allow for a lot of space during your ovulatory uh, cycle, especially when you're ovulating. And especially. Especially, so what does that look like for you? Because I, I typically allow for that space like I, I cut out all obligations during my menstrual phase, especially during the first three days. I'm very like, okay, no plans, no tech, no, you know, I just cut out everything and I'm just by myself and, you know, anything that comes through, whether it's journaling, painting, dancing, whatever that comes through during that time, very introverted and I'm not engaging with the world as such. Would you say that during the creative phase as well, you would want to be, again, in a, a more receptive state where you have the time to be by yourself and introspect a little bit more? I would, I'm going to add a nuance. So the uh, first muse, which is what I, the, how I signify the start of the cycle, is it's really interesting. The neuroscience from first muse is we, we, when you look at women speak about their experience, we're all kind of saying the same things. We all are introverted. We kind of like want to kind of be in our space. We want to be in like the red tent in a moon lodge. And when you look at like, I, I, when I saw and read Dr. Shelley Carson's Your Creative Brain, the one brain set that I thought was missing that I added was was the rest like what when we're not creatively thinking like you know in, in the creative process it's always like go pulling back and like stepping away from the creative work and I was like I bet that that is a part of the menstrual cycle or the part of the menstrual uh, phase of the cycle and I bet that that has something to do with the default mode network so this part of the brain that activates when the brain's not really thinking actively thinking and so, and so the neuroscience is just coming out of like to, to support the, the suspicions that I've observed through my own body's data. And so that's really cool. And so it's so super cool to see us all kind of say the same thing. But where it's different with fourth muse is first muse is more of like a creative retreat and a withdrawal and a restoration period. Fourth muse, so at the peak of the cycle, when estrogen is like, you know, having us blossom to like the world around us, it's more of a creating of space to open for novel experience. So it's more of a, the brain lets go of, um, the part of the brain that loves to control outcomes goes offline. And then all the back of the brain, the sensory association networks come online. And so you can imagine why you would want to have an open, receptive schedule because you're, we're literally primed to be responsive to opportunities in the environment. We actually have an increase of wanderlust. If you look at, uh, at mammals, which we are as humans, as a species, we're mammals, like we, we move more, we want to go out and explore more. And if you can imagine if we have to sit down with our work schedule or we're in a startup accelerator or we are trying to get some tech done or we're trying to do something for engineering. If we just sit at the computer for eight hours all day, that's going to create a lot of friction and, and not a lot of flow. And I have tested this myself. Like there was one time where I was trying to do a business, like a business accelerator competition or something like that. And I literally like during fourth views at the peak of my ovulation, I was like sitting in front of the computer for eight hours all day. And I wanted to crawl out of my skin because my body wanted to be moving. My, my focus didn't want to be so pinpointed. And as soon as I got that task done, I literally just like, I, I don't even remember what I did, but I, all I know is I was getting back into like that kind of like, 
you know, absorb, like getting, getting back into the magic of the moment and being open and like not so focused just so I could feel reintegrated with myself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think I understand it better now. So the first muse correlates with the menstrual cycle and that's when it's recovery, active recovery, rest, introspection. And then as you go into the fourth muse, that's your, you know, peak population. And that's not more so you become introverted or go into introspection. It's more that you create the environment where you are open to novel experiences. So you might schedule, a, you know, a trip away for a couple of days or a day even or right. taking on walks and be in nature you know whatever floats your boat or you just want something novel uh to experience during that time and that's because like dopamine is really heightened at this time and what is dopamine about going after a reward yeah. pleasure opportunity yeah. environment you know and so and it's really cool because um in the flow cycle and the flow neurobiology often the the like the kind of deactivation of the prefrontal cortex so that like flow can emerge is it's 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 so fascinating how like the flow cycle and the flow neurobiology is actually already embedded in the ovulatory cycle it's like this is what women are doing who ovulate every month our bodies and brains are naturally going through a deep frontal lobe activation where we're getting absorbed in time and space. And we're, you know, like we're feeling like a heightened sense of enrichment with our environment. And then all of a sudden ovulation happens and we're feeling like a peak and a height of, you know, of uh, our 10,000 hours and, and spontaneous delivery of skill. And so, so it's just, it's really cool to kind of see this pattern. And what I notice about myself, I definitely have those experiences when I'm ovulating that, you know, something amazing comes through and I'm like, yo, who was that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> but then I notice that it's only if I allow for the rest and recovery during my menstrual phase and I don't push too hard uh, that those kind of cycles, you know, naturally show up. So in the modern world, women aren't, you know, it's not like, like, oh, you can take a few days off if you come on your period. Like, but then I have to sync my activities accordingly. So if you're allowing for that rest during menstruation and then during the next phase between the ovulation, right, what do you then, what do you personally tend to engage in during the different uh, phases of the cycle? Right, right. This, everyone has a different view on this. Um, my view might not be the most popular one because I, I feel that it all depends. Like what an inventor needs to do and the activities an inventor needs to do is very different than like a mother needs to do. That's very different than a student needs to do. But ultimately, if the pattern or and energy flows are the same, I think what's what we don't get trained in and why I think planning and cycle syncing and a lot of like our best, like every year, everyone gets new planners and journals and do we ever really use them all year long? Like there's a, something I noticed that we are missing in, in when it comes to tracking time. And I think it's because we're trying to control outcomes in time when time is actually biological. I think that's the missing part. We're trying, we treat time as if it's something we can control, but time is a function of biology. And so what I have done, because I tried to, I tried um, thinking about my, I literally, I used to put the moon phases on my, on my calendar and I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to like plan work with the moon phases. And I was like, okay, that's kind of not working. And then I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna like take the astrological wheel and like maybe there's something going on there. And then I was just like, huh, but it's not always syncing up. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, maybe it has something to do with like, you know, if the moon is full and then I'm bleeding or if the moon is new. And I was like trying, I was like playing all these gymnastics about like how to like sync up my body with time instead of actually just simply training my body's sixth sense of perfect timing, my body's ability to feel perfect timing in the moment. And for me, my personal outcome, when I try to plan my cycle, 
out or activities out. I can make the best laid plans, but it's better for me to be my own like personal meteorologist. It's kind of like predicting the weather. I really can only know about three to four days out. And so, you know, kind of like the weather, like once you get to a 10 day forecast, you're yeah, maybe not, right? Yeah. And so what I find is when I let go of control and kind of give in to flow and, and like cycles of time and to, and to really hone this like inner sense of timing, I find that my predictive power goes through the roof and all of a sudden I couldn't even plan these things better myself. All of a sudden, like things are like perfectly synced. Like when I, one example of this is, and this is, this is high stick stuff. This isn't like, you know, this isn't like, oh, Shara, like, isn't that really sweet? You know, like, oh, how, how nice. You just get to do art all day. No, this was me. This is how I got through inventing, becoming a U.S inventor which is a very hard thing to do if you're not working in a research and development uh you know uh arm of a company with a lot of money and so i remember i just aligned i had i had just had honed such a sense of perfect timing of where i was at and how i would like move through each of these phases in my cycle and like I would show, I practice showing up in that phase in my fullness. So if I'm in first muse, I practice showing up in first muse, even if I have a meeting. I practice showing up in fourth muse, even if I have to sit on a computer all day. Like, because then it's honing and training this predictive power, this ability to feel where I'm at. So then that gives me more options to kind of like be almost like play like, alch like time alchemy. Like I'm gonna mix a little here, and then I'm gonna mix a little there, and then most times, more than not, the, it, it kind of syncs up and works out itself. So um, this happened again with my patent. It's like I needed, I had a very important meeting. I had to deliver something truly novel, like the next level, to get to, from um, from the, into the next stage of the patent process, and it just eureka. And then I do, and that's, that's what I was able to file my, um, my, uh, utility, uh, my provisional patent application on. That's amazing. And I think there's something to be said about embodiment and interception ability as well, when it comes to understanding what your cycle is trying to tell you, what your hormones are trying to tell you, what your ovaries are trying to speak to you. You know, it, it, it's like, um, it's not. I don't think women are trained in the modern era, not even trained. Women have inherently they're intuitive and have the ability to tune into their bodies. But I think the modern world sort of takes it out of them because they've always tried to fit into this kind of patriarchal structure of ways of working and, um, you know, the industrial revolution and all of that. You have the kind of set ways of how you show up. And that doesn't account for the ebbs and flows that comes along with a woman's cycle right? And so for someone, I think, you know, we're both dancers. So we are kind of very much in tune with our bodies already uh, on some level. And for people that are embodied and practice embodiment practices, uh, along with that kind of awareness of how the body is and what the body is, and you know, what's your body trying to say to you? If, if you're not one of those people, then how does a woman, you know, tap into that power because it is a superpower to be able to, to ride the highs and the, the you know to ride the wave of our cycle right right um i'm really reminded of the work of john coates he's a he is a uh, researcher a neuroscientist uh, at oxford he wrote a book called the hour between dog and wolf he studied project um pardon me he studied testosterone and, and, and traders on Wall Street and on the London, London trading room floor. And he made a headline with this research finding, traders in tune with their heartbeats make more money. And literally our ovaries <laughs> are easier to feel than our heartbeats. Literally, literally, if I were trying to tune into my heartbeat right now, it would, be, it would take so much more training then to be able to kind of tune in one layer deeper 
into this magic in between my two legs and feel what's going on with my, with my cycle and my ovaries. And I think that it's, it's maybe for a woman who's like, hmm, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready for that. I, I, I think it's see that there's a moon inside of you. And the one face of the moon that we, it's like kind of like the moon, there's a dark side of the moon. Well, the other side of the moon is the ovarian cycle, is the estrogen, is the progesterone, is like the joie, is the peak. But we don't even have a word. Like words are so important to our neurobiology because we don't have a word to describe what our body experiences. We literally might be blind to it. And when I think about how is it that across cultures, we have so many words for period. But if I were to say, what is the universal word for ovulation? Right? Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, well, it's, it's, I'm amused. I'm musing. I am amused. I, I am putting it out in the culture and hopefully it picks up so that yeah. we have a way to describe. And I love this term, like, to be amused is to be delighted. And that's exactly the function of estrogen. <laughs> like it is delighting you. It is literally lighting you up. It is like to be amusing. It's like you're like these, these, these um, humor and, and creativity and novelty. It's like happening in the brain at this time. And so I, I think that, I think that to take on a new language that is not a negative language or a derogatory language, that, but that is a powerful language. Just even one word, I am, or one phrase, I am amused, could be the beginning of this whole new box of sensation and feeling that can inform and help us feel more of what's going on inside of our own bodies. Because I, I, I truly believe if a traitor who's in tune with this heartbeat can make more money and that, like have predictive power our cycles are it, it, it's like it's we're, we're always feeling what's going on our cycles are always communicating to us and if we if we if we do the things and nurture ourselves and cultivate and move beyond like period pain but we move into period power and then like 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 the the delight of the muse and we embrace more of what's going on in, in our root chakra, in our second chakra. Like if we, if, we, if we see that there's a fertility and creativity link, if we know that there's this ebb and flow to how our bodies and minds work, if, if, if I have a changing body, then I also have a changing brain. If we're like, I am nine women in one, and we embrace that, then, we're, we're, we're starting to have an inner, a, a, a more honed inner awareness that we might not have if we're just thinking about tracking our period. Yeah, I think definitely there's something to be said about, you know, tapping into that power and, the, and then understanding how that relates to how you show up in life, right? So taking that time to be like, okay, how do I feel? And from, but then you have all these like external influences, right? That can change right. your state. And, and uh, of course, like, you know, traders, heart rate variability. I think heart rate variability matters for anyone, right? If you have a stronger vagal tone, then that's a, that's a predictor of, you know, um, good health. And right. you know, consequently, you know, great performance. You have to feel your best to perform your best, right? right. So... So during, within the menstrual cycle, like I, I genuinely like, I don't know how it works, right? But when I was blind to my own ovulatory cycle, I used to experience pain during my periods. But once I developed awareness and once I started embodying activities that, you know, synced to my cycles, I don't feel that pain anymore. You know, right. I don't feel pain. Um, I find that fascinating as well that, you know, your menstrual period can be your power as well, because um, 
I find that during that period of introspection, I get a lot of insight. I get that deep active recovery that I need. And, and, you know, there is the flow cycle as well. Right. So, right. before you know, like when I heard about the flow cycle, I was just like, okay, I need to incorporate this within my day, but then, you know, flipping it and incorporating the flow cycle into my, my cycle, my ovulatory cycle was even better actually, because, because I, I feel like you know, the, the, the recovery is a menstrual phase and I feel like flow and release sort of comes during ovulatory phase and the struggle is usually during that period. It's both the luteal and the follicular phase right. as well. Like I find that struggle usually happens during that time. Um, I don't know what your experience is and how you would um, kind of correlate the flow cycle to the ovulatory cycle. <laughs> well, I mapped the neuroscience of it. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to tell you. I would love to tell you because this is kind of like breaking news. <laughs> so, um, what's really cool is in the flow neurobiology. It's it's um, in the beginning of the um, what would be called like the struggle is uh, they were associating it with um, cortisol and norepinephrine and what's really interesting is in the luteal phase when uh hormones are low there there can be more sensitivity to cortisol and once you get through about day three four in the menstrual phase you actually there's a hormone that actually starts to it correlates with an increase in arousal transmitters in the brain so literally fsh which starts your new follicular phase which happens about, you know, halfway in through your menstrual period, starts to stimulate arousal neurotransmitters like norepinephrine. And it actually correlates with a beta focus in the brain. This is what the neuroscience says. This is what I mapped. And this is, this is second muse. This is what I mapped out in second muse. Third muse is the state in, uh, then it talks about how uh, we go from a nor cortisol to norepinephrine from like a beta state into then the flow and release. And that is associated with alpha wave coherence and increase and dopamine. This happens during fourth muse, during the estrogen peak and the luteinizing hormone surge, which is just so fascinating. And then gamma and theta waves also associated with like ovulation, which is like the luteinizing hormone surge. And then we go into like the, um, the period after that, I forgot what they call it in the flow cycle model. It's the um, oxytocin phase. It's the recovery phase. Progesterone and oxytocin are correlated. So when you start to look at the flow cycle and you map it over what the body is doing, you know, what the ovaries are doing, it's like the brain stimulates follicular stimulating hormone. The ovaries start to produce estrogen. Estrogen increases, luteinizing hormone surges to induce ovulation then bringing on the peak of progesterone. This is from a beta state to an alpha state to a theta state to a recovery state with oxytocin. <laughs> it's literally like norepinephrine to uh, dopamine to uh, all the endorphins that come from a eureka moment to oxytocin. It, it all lines up. The neurobiology of flow and the neurobiology of the female cycle, of the I lined up immune cycles that I've like, I mapped out, it all lines up. It's almost like I think that like we, we are flow. As females, we literally are flow. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's, if we just surrender to our own biological magic, flow is just a byproduct, you know? That is it. That, that's why I don't give, I'm very cautious to give um any prescriptive advice to anyone because where's the discovery in that mm. right where and because there's they're so they're, trust me there is there's there is plenty of people who are going to give plenty of routines and, and prescriptions but for me it's all about how much can you feel do you feel how much how much can you sense what does fertility feel like what does progesterone feel like what does estrogen feel like what does 
you know, what does, what does um, day four of your cycle feel like? Like really drop into the feeling of that, really drop into the observation of that, really drop into like the knowing of that and flow just, just is a byproduct of that awareness. I, and I completely agree and I completely feel the same way about it. But for those women who are completely new to the tracking, they don't okay. understand, um, you know, basal body temperature. They don't understand what it feels. And maybe they don't even have that interceptive ability. They don't have that ability to be in touch with their bodies. And they, they're not very embodied as, as um, consciously. Then what advice would you give? You know, what are your top three advice for women that you know, want to learn more about their own bodies and want to be able to embody flow. What right, right. So I would splurge on um, your own period care package because there's some really great period panties that didn't exist when I was a girl. There's some <laughs> really great like tampons and pads and cups that didn't exist when I was a kid. Like I really would like, if you're really learning and, 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 and becoming aware of your cycle for the first time, I would really create the most, the most beautiful ritual around your bleeding time that you can. Um, it's something that I did for myself because I had a sister in my life. We actually belly danced together for many years. And she, like, as much as I'm like, woo, period power, I, I wasn't always like this. I actually inherited some real garbage from the culture about what this bleeding time was. And so now it's like, you know, I'll just like have the most sensuous, like, you know, uh, lotions that I just really nurture myself with. I have the most delicious and exquisite chocolate. I have like the coolest, like, you know, period panties. <laughs> <laughs> and really like create this, like this cycle care package. Um, so, so I would really treat something that was, that we may have inherited as a negative as one of the most treasured and cherished experiences. So that's the first thing I would do. Right. And so what that, the, yeah. And, and just, just taking a moment to shout out menstrual cups because they've changed my life. <laughs> right. Right. I never thought you'd tell me in a million years I'd be using one and I'd, I'd be like, Oh my God, I would never. And then like, now I'm like, not, not even, it doesn't even face me. It's so natural. Yeah. <laughs> you no. Know? Then the other thing I would, the second thing I would do is to commune with the nature because when you, look at nature, you will see yourself. You will see yourself. You will literally have, it's like kind of like you have to have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. You will move past the, uh, the culture that you may have inherited that, that is this, you know, in my culture, it's this Western myth of success that I have had to divorce from my identity. And I looked at the same tree every day for eight seasons. And because I looked at one tree every day for eight seasons, it enhanced my power of observation. And I literally was able to say, oh my God, what that tree does in response to the seasons is how I feel my body changing in response to my hormones. So because I had an actual natural pattern, I was able to see a pattern inside of myself. And then the third thing I would do is, keep a journal, keep a journal of your experience, like really journal what you feel. And, and I, I didn't start with fertility tracking. Really. I just started with, um, I, I really started with just kind of noting like my, my creative thinking. And I really wasn't, I wasn't learning the fertility awareness method yet, but I didn't quite know all the terminology yet. I didn't have like, you know, now I'm a fertility educator, but like then I was just kind of, I'm still kind of figuring it out. But I really was just, I was really using um, a journal. And at this case, at this point, it was just the journal in, in a cycle tracker that I thought was pretty cool in the app store. So find, find something in the app store that really appeals to you. Make sure you check out the privacy policy. Be, be, be aware of that. Check out, do your homework and look at the terms and conditions in the privacy policy so they're not selling your intimate information on Facebook. 
but <laughs> but really make use of that section that they give you to make notes and if you really like ha if you treat the awareness and the cultivation of awareness of how you feel and you know and and to create a ritual around around your period you might actually find another phase in your cycle that you want to create another ritual around and then another phase in your cycle that you want to create another ritual around and another phase in your cycle you want to create another ritual around and before you know it you have all your plans and seeking and environments and rituals that you need you know what to eat because you've been already practicing it through ritual you know how you want to exercise because you've already been you know exercising your will through ritual you know how you want to create and show up to work because you've actually been using ritual of like these phases in your cycle through you know just your own like kind of self devotion and, and cherishing your own body. Yes, yes, yes. Those are some three amazing tips for you know women to really, really start on this journey of empowerment within their cycles because I really think it's revolutionary if every woman can use this cycle to to really embody how they want to show up in the world and really again undercut this understanding of what it means to be productive in today's society right. and bringing that more feminine aspect into it so that we can balance that yin and yang you know that, that some balance of like how we show up and and you know because our natural cycles balance if we surrender to it naturally balance the masculine feminine aspects right so there are points where we're like go 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 but there are points when we're like i'm just gonna sit here you know <laughs> i'm just gonna sit <laughs> oh this is one thing i meant to mention but i forgot you know i really feel like i don't have any fears around menopause anymore i don't have any fears about perimenopause. i'm 42 and it doesn't even phase me where before it was just like a very scary thing you know i was just like oh my god it's like my is my cycle gonna change like oh my god it's like and now i'm like mm -mm, mm -mm, no no that's that's like such an empowering view to take on as well like i'm not afraid of menopause because i think many women are i was i was terrified i literally was terrified this is me doing my own mental game on myself <laughs> <laughs> right but it's the reason why i was why i was so fearful is because i didn't have access to my own body's data but now that I see my own body's data consistently, regularly, I see how dynamic I am. I see that that dynamicism is actually healthy. I have no fears. And I don't listen to gurus. When people tell me I'm 35 and I'm going through perimenopause and that's when it starts, I'm like, maybe it does for some women. Yeah, that's what they preach in the West. <laughs> maybe it does for some women, but uh, I was raised in an organic garden. I've been dancing my whole life and i i have been ovulating for a long time i haven't been on birth control so i'm probably going to be okay and so that's the thing is like when we what i hope for the next generation is because i don't i don't know what it's like in india but in the u.s it's let's get them on birth control when they're 14 years old because she's having some acne and she's just going to stand and some women are on birth control for like three decades of their life you know for like two decades and then they get off and then they get married and then they try to have a baby and then they don't, then they're like, this is the worst thing has ever happened to me. I can't conceive. And it's like, honey, you've been on birth control for 20 years and you started when you were 14 years old. It's yeah. heartbreaking. I mean, I, I can see why there is an aspect of like, oh, it's empowering. But for me personally, and this is probably an unpopular opinion and a very personal opinion, of course, I am against birth control. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, well, I, I literally am against it because I tried it and my whole body, it was the, one of the worst health crises I've ever had. So I literally am, my cells are against birth control. It's, it just wreaks such havoc on, on, on the women's body and there's not enough research and it's, it's just like you ovulate for like a couple of days a month and you're going to take this pill every day right. for, for like 20, 30 years, like right. doesn't make any sense. Right, 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 right. I know it doesn't make any sense at all, especially with like, I mean, that's why I'm very hopeful for, I think the fertility awareness methods 
um, they need to get updated. They're kind of stuck in methods from the 80s. Like BBT is great, but we have Ava fertility bracelet now. Like we have like the mirror fertility monitor. Like I literally can like pee on a stick, put it in my Ava fertility monitor and literally get a quantified read of what's going on with my estrogen and luteinizing hormone search. And so I literally will know what's going on. Like I literally have um, on Saturday, I'm getting this, um, this, it's called keg and you insert it into your body and it like takes a sonar technology pulse. I know it sounds weird, but it literally will read how much cervical mucus I have. So I'm going to be getting like the most like primo primo data on my cervical mucus. Like that is how you can do hormone free effective like pregnancy prevention because the like literally the tech we're going to be getting in the next like five years next 10 years is just gonna i it, hopefully my, i pray that it makes birth control obsolete or they create some new kind of birth control that isn't like fucking up our hormones and our brains and our bodies and our um, our sort of central nervous system and our emotions like it did for me it was horrible it was horrible yeah, and I think for a lot of women have horror stories around birth control, and 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 I can't wait for all of this amazing femtech to just merge into some amazing, beautiful form of all encompassing empowerment. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, I'm like, what is India doing? There's so much cool engineering going on in India. Like, definitely not working on birth control. <laughs> Um, <laughs> with a population of over a billion people <laughs> right right like seriously yeah and maybe our femtech in the u.s isn't approved for other countries i i don't know much about that i would imagine that like i try to get this like this this piece of tech that was approved for natural family planning in europe but i wasn't allowed to purchase it in the united states so i don't even know if like different countries have different rules for different tech. I don't even know. I think they might, but I think India is really, really behind on in, in, in even talking about these things, right? Even though like these things have been mentioned in ancient texts, I think all of that has been kind of, you know, like you mentioned about all the goddesses and all the archetypes surrounding the goddesses and how they embody even the different phases of the cycle and, right. and all that amazing stuff, right? And all of the different archetypes and that it's almost like you could even have like a different goddess representing each hormonal phase that a woman right. Has true right and there are literally the temples um, that you can immerse yourself in and the, and the rituals for each like seriously it's so cool it's amazing but sadly that doesn't translate into what's happening today it's not like women have that right. kind of understanding of okay what is it really the goddesses are representing and how does that relate to me you know it, it's right that goddess is separate to them it's not like they consider the goddesses you know an archetype within themselves um right but at the same time like even though like menstruation is celebrated when when a woman approaches puberty and goes through her first menstrual cycle it's actually celebrated. that's celebrated in india yeah, yeah. that's amazing not in, in the u.s it's celebrated not, not you get gifts you get like, there's rituals, there's, um, you know, people bring you gold sometimes, people. What is it called? Is it called something? It's called different things in different states, okay. cultures, different cultures within like India, different religions. Um, right, right. However, after that initial celebration, it goes back to being taboo, which is the crazy thing. <laughs> That's kind of crazy, that is kind of crazy. You know what my mom did? This is how I celebrated when I got my period. I was like, mom, I got my period. And she's like, okay. Oh, she got all excited. My mom's kind of a trickster and a jokester. And she's like, oh, why do you come in and buy it? I was like, no, 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 I don't want to buy this pass. And then she's literally, I'm hiding in the car. And she like literally is parked like right in front of the drugstore. And I'm just like, oh my God, my mom's buying pass for me. And then she shows up and she disappears. She shows up to the front door of the drugstore. And she's like, hi. Mortified. I'm like, ah! Everyone sees they're fine. So anyway, so that that's that's what we get in America. <laughs> <laughs> and 
that, that, was, that, was, that was a long time ago too. Maybe it's different now <laughs> with Instagram. Thank you so much for sharing Absolutely. your video. And I love the Flow Sutra. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn so much and, you know, to, to hear about your work and, and where can people find you? Where can people support you? And ah, thank you so much. So uh, I am on Instagram, uh, muse.cycles, uh, also musecycles.co.co, musecycles.co. I have a boutique experience that I run digitally that helps women tune into all of these new states. And really like you could think of it like the ultimate awareness program for awakening mental, physical, and creative prowess. Thank you so much for being here, absolute pleasure. And um, I'm sure that you know, your work is going to make ripples across the world soon enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Flow Sutra podcast. As always, head over to razorsally.com for all of the juicy details on all things flow. And if you have any questions, any comments, any thoughts, I would love to hear from you. Shoot me an email at razor at razorsally.com. Wishing you a beautiful week and see you next time. Bye.